Our next speaker is Neil Gershenfield. We're so excited to have him as our after lunch keynote speaker. Thank you. Good, thank you. Um, I'm truly delighted to be here and see a bunch of old friends in the audience and I guess friends to be. So in the next half hour, I want to talk about scaling and why what you're doing today is uh, perhaps more important than you might realize. So Gordon Moore in 1965 made a graph with five points. He was counting transistors on a chip and he noticed they lined up on a log plot, which means they're doubling. And he said, what if that carried for 10 years? What would the future look like? Um, what actually happened was 50 years. Gordon Moore's five data points ran for 50 years, and we had di the internet, personal computers, digital revolution in computing, communication, the stuff that makes everything here possible. So this is a book I recently wrote about digital fabrication. And for that book, I took the data on Fab Labs. And so this is the number of Fab Labs. I'll, I'll send a link for this presentation uh, afterwards. This is the number of Fab Labs versus year. Um, and they line up on a straight line on a log plot. And in fact, this is 10 years. So for 10 years, Fab Labs have been scaling exponentially. This is more data than Gordon Moore had when he did Moore's Law. And so the question I want to ask this afternoon is, what if this goes for 50 years? What does it mean to open hardware, not if you can buy a 3D printer, but if you have 50 years of scaling of digital fabrication? And it, the implications are much larger than just a circuit board or a 3D printer. So um, to look at that scaling, data point number one is this. Uh, a few blocks that way, there is a building that still has a plaque on it that had this in it. This was the whirlwind. This was the first significant real-time computer. And modern operating systems happened here. And a few blocks that, and that was 1951, a few blocks that way in, in 1952, MIT made the first computer controlled manufacturing machine. They, this machine roughly got connected to a machine to make parts. So that's data point number one. There is one of each of these. Uh, the successor to that is a few more blocks that way. I run a lab at MIT that has one of roughly every machine to make anything. These are the modern descendants, the things that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to make anything of any size. I first realized the scaling was lurking when I started a class for students to use the research tools called How to Make Almost Anything. It was aimed at like 10 research students, and every year hundreds of students show up to take the class um, to make stuff. So Kelly made a device that saves up screens and plays it back later when it's convenient. And this is a web browser for parrots. And this is an alarm clock you wrestle with and prove you're awake. And this was a dress that defends your personal space. And that happened so consistently, I realized the students were answering a question I didn't ask, which is, what is the use of digital fabrication? And that's personal fabrication, which is not to make what you can buy, it's to make what you can't buy. It's not mass, it's personal manufacturing. So um, that led to um, this. So the whirlwind was transistorized at MIT, was commercialized by digital equipment, it became the PDP, and this picture, um, if you've never seen it, is actually one of the most important pictures to your life. Um, this is Brian, um, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie at Bell Labs inventing Unix. Modern operating systems are happening in that picture at that moment. And they could do it because instead of filling a building, the computer filled the room. It was on the scale of a work group. Um, and there were thousands of the, these mini computers. And a thousand is an interesting number. A thousand is the number of cities on Earth, so roughly one per city. And interestingly, if you go back to the graph I showed you, today there's about 1,500 fab labs, roughly a thousand. And so there's roughly one fab lab per city. So where fab labs came from was Congress passed a rule that agencies have to measure their social impact. Uh, NSF had funded the facility I'm running. NSF didn't know how to do it, so they turned to people like me and said, you have to measure your social impact. We didn't know how to do it, but we thought the machines were cool. So we put together a mini version of the lab as it exists today, and also a microcosm of how it's going to eventually exist. So a fab lab today is two tons. It's a $100,000 investment. It has a 3D printer, but it has all these other tools 
to do the range of digital fabrication processes to make functional systems. And all the fab labs in the network share these capabilities. And so with that fab lab, um, we did one in Boston, a collaboration led to doing it at Sankundi Takaradi in Ghana. That led to a ca collaboration in Sochengovi in South Africa. That led to a collaboration in Ling Seidit in Norway. And then they just started doubling. Every time we opened one, somebody else wanted one. We didn't plan a global revolution, but uh, this is the current world map and doubling times a year and a half. With the tools in a fab lab, you can make all of this. You can make electronics, boats, bicycles, furniture, production tooling, consumer electronics. Um, the, the biggest projects go all the way up to housing, large scale um, housing made as a big rapid prototyping project. Um, those have spawned a number of open source programs that have come out of the lab network. But what's even more important than those projects are the programs themselves. So uh, this is Barcelona's mayor. Barcelona has a fabulous design sense and over 50% youth unemployment. Whole generation can't work as we understand it. Um, but this great design sense. And so um, they started a project to make fab labs part of urban infrastructure. So like the city provides electricity and clean water, it's now providing the means to make as part of the infrastructure of the city. This is Barcelona's mayor starting a 40-year countdown to urban self-sufficiency. Instead of products going in and trash going out, they want data to come and go, the bits come and go, globally sharing knowledge, but the atoms stay, you don't ship them. Um, this is a lab we ran at the White House. I don't know if Nadia is here yet, one of my former student who's at the meeting. And then this is Congressman Bill Foster, who has a really interesting bill in the Congress in the US, in the House and the Senate, for universal access to digital fabrication. In the same way we now expect uh, phones and uh, internet, telephones, you should have access to, there's legislation in Congress right now to charter in the national interest creating a national network of connected local labs as part of universal access to digital fabrication. It's one of the programs going out of this. Um, for time, I'll, I'll give you the link to this presentation that has videos of all of these people explaining these things. So this Fab City project um, has grown to all of these cities, like uh, Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, Oakland, Detroit, have signed up to this Barcelona commitment. It's not a step function, it's a 40-year countdown to transition from products going in and trash going out to data goes in and out, but the bits stay. The cities can produce what they consume. It's this really interesting work group of cities reinventing a new economy. Um, in Detroit, there's an amazing fab lab buying up um, uh, bankrupt parts of the city and really bootstrapping a whole new economy where some of the time in the lab is for commercial gain, you get money. Some of it is for a post-salary economy where you do barter and trade and about a third of the time is for, not for, for economy, it's for art, for play, for discovery, as sort of, you know, sort of architecting a new notion of how an economy works in the city. Not as a projection for the future, but today. Um, in Barcelona, they're now up to not just a fab lab, they're taking a whole district, Poblenau, and using it to make a microcosm of the fab district, where the whole district can function as a somewhat closed ecosystem where um, the whole life cycle of production and consumption um, can stay within that district. Um, this is a project we did with the UN and a number of NGOs like Terre des Hommes to do humanitarian relief, where instead of sending solutions to humanitarian problems, you send data and then you have digital fabrication tools locally to produce solutions, both immediate needs, but more important, the, the needs beyond the immediate needs, education, creating economy, infrastructure, um, all of that. Um, to keep up with this, like the class at MIT, um, bright inventive people come out of the woodwork everywhere we do this, in rural India, in Arctic villages, in African shanty towns. And so we started a program called the Fab Academy. See, I don't know if Adriana is here. Um, she's at the meeting who came from this. Um, the way the Fab Academy works is MIT is like a mainframe. You come here and get processed. It, it's effective, but it's only a small number of people. Uh, massive online classes are like time sharing. You're connected to the educational mainframe, but you're a terminal. Um, the Fab Academy works like the internet. Students have peers with mentors. 
in work groups locally, and then we connect them in a global network for education, for uh, mentoring, curation, things like you learn how to use an Arduino, then you learn how to make an Arduino, then you learn how to pick processor families, you learn to 3D print, but then you learn how to do molding and casting, then you learn how to lay up composites, mentoring from easy to hard in this globally distributed network. And, um, I'll skip this for time, but this was a fun project. This was a student project where he wanted food. And so the first day he just made a sketch. And by the end of this, he made this whole aquaponic system to grow food. And in fact, it's become now an aquapioneer pro uh, project for a dense urban efficient agriculture as an example of that. Um, that spawned a bioacademy. Jean-Michel is here who helped um, with uh, George Church, one of the leading biologists in the world at Harvard. Um, to build a program where roughly um, use a, fa a, a fab lab to make a bio lab and you learn to do biotechnology. Um, that spawned a program called Fab Academy um, to do textile technologies across this network. All of this isn't do it yourself in isolation. It's not online, it's not go to a central site, it's a network. It's, it's learning work groups in these labs locally then functioning as network uh, globally. Um, let's see, I see, let's see, Elliot's here, from, I see a number of people involved in these around the world. So once a year all these labs gather, um, we did it in France this year. Um, if you're interested in this global network, it's going to be hosted by this team in uh, Egypt uh, next summer, in this growing global lab network. And so the way you should think about all of that in scaling is right at the transition from the mini computer era is where the internet was invented. Email, video games, word processing all happened then. And that's where at the moment right now, a thousand fab labs is a huge number, but it's a tiny number. It's only one per city. But what we're doing right now is the equivalent of inventing the internet. If anybody can make anything anywhere and you can share the information, how do you run it? How do you organize it? What is an economy? What is business? What is education? The technology of the internet changed, but we've been living for decades since with the organizations that emerged then, and that's the moment we're at right now. Um, so, uh, to keep scaling, uh, from a th thousands of mini computers, there were millions of hobbyist computers. This was the MITS Altair. It was, it was actually from uh, White Sands Missile Range Technicians, but they called it MITS because they thought it would sell better if it had MIT in the name. Um, but when it first came out, the killer app was you could flip switches to load a program, and then you would watch the light blink. <laughs> that was it. But the, uh, a company got started to write software for all this called Micro-Soft, and eventually they took Dash out. Um, a, a, a group met around this, a, and they called themselves the Homebrew Computer Club that became Apple. A whole generation grew on these hobbyist computers. And so these got up to millions, and a million is an interesting number. It's the number of towns. And so for the million scale, what's happening is you can't spend $100,000 and two tons and keep scaling Fab Labs that way. And so um, a while back, we started looking at not rapid prototyping, but rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping, how a fab lab makes a fab lab. And so these are a range of fab lab machines made on fab lab machines. Um, this is um, a complete, this is Alan and Nadia who I'll talk more about. This is a complete fab facility in a briefcase with interchangeable end effectors that do the range of processes. That project led to lots of companies like Form Labs and Shaper and Other Mill um, that Brie Pettis bought recently. Um, and it led to lots of software, like working with Autodesk and Fusion and SolidWorks. But not that many people made the machines. The designs were open. Anybody could make those machines, but not many people did. We were disappointed. And then we realized we're really making a historical mistake, which was the difference between the internet and um, the bitnet, or a phone network, is the bitnet the terminal couldn't change what mainframe did. You had to change it centrally. The internet grew at the edges. What the internet does is based on what you connect to it, not how you build it. And software used to be written as a big program. Software is now written in reusable modules. Machines aren't made that way. A machine is like BitNet. It's like Fortran. You make a machine and nothing ever changes. So um, Nadia, who you will meet, um, and many of you know, started this fun project um, uh, to make modular machine parts, and this was a particularly simple version out of cardboard, 
where with the cardboard construction kit, you, you cut out machine parts, you then snap them together in networks. Um, and then she sent these to Fab Labs around the world. Um, and these are beginners in a week making machines. This was a plotting machine. This was a scanning machine. Um, this is a coffee stirring machine. This is a marble light show machine. Um, but this is like a multi-axis hot wire cutter machine. All of those were done in a week by machine building beginners because it's object-oriented hardware. Each of those objects is a physical object, it's a communicating object, and a computing object all in one thing you can compose to make machines. So she inspired Jens, a designer in Norway, who spent two years touring the world visiting Fab Labs. Here he's um, in Kisumu in Western Kenya giving slippers to Obama's grandmother that, uh, for a Fab Lab in Kenya that were designed into Fab Lab in Japan. And what Jens did beautifully was he took Nadia's axes and hardened them. He came up, he made designs where the axes could make their own motion system um, with this beautiful design for embedded, integrated rack and pinions with glide blocks that means this machine looks like a normal machine, but it actually made almost all of its own parts. There's just a few parts that the machine can't make. So the machine really is good, able to make almost all its own parts. And then my student, Jake, who is Jake here? Uh, Jake will also be here. Um, he's picked up from Jens and Nadia to push this idea of not rapid prototyping, but rapid prototyping of rapid prototyping, make the machine as easily as the project on the machine. So here's a video I will go through of, um, that's an Ivan Illich reference. Um, there's a parametric machine generator that lets you pick how big are the axes, how many axes, what degrees of freedom. Uh, then um, it, it, it emits parts you can plot out and assemble um, to put together the machine. Then crucially, each degree of the freedom of the machine is a node in a data flow network. It has no idea what it is. There's nothing built into it. It just passes message. This is a software framework I wrote, uh, I'll, I'll say a bit more, where you implement the, the controls. And so you have these modular degrees of freedom with this data flow network in hardware with a stateless machine. The machine doesn't know anything about itself. Then you make these software data flow graphs and the software control graph talks to the hardware control graph and uh, makes a machine. But it's sort of a virtual machine uh, controller. And so rather than G codes or STLs, there are no file formats. You're passing data in distributed computations that is the machine. And so that was a clay extruder at Haystack. That was a milling machine. This is a drawing machine. Um, this, is a, this is to play a piece of music by Steve Reich machine, uh, music for blocks of wood. And the point is that th this is all the same bits. And if you want open loop or closed loop or additive or subtractive or three or four or five axes, you don't change anything in the machine. You just change the degrees of freedom in the machine. And so to do this, we had to really redo end-to-end -end CAD CAM machine control, motion control. Um, I had worked um, closely with Google and Mozilla on implementing high-performance computing with real-time message passing um, in browser to make these. Um, we were separately designing CAD tools, CAM tools, machine control tools, motion control tools, and you'd throw things over the transom between them, and data couldn't come back in the same way it goes forward. This lets you build an integrated environment where end-to-end -end you can build these workflows, but crucially you can edit the workflows within the workflows um, to, to do rapid workflow composition. And so what all of that is adding up to is really revisiting the foundations of what is a machine to do rapid machine building um, so that instead of going to a fab lab to buy a fab lab, um, you go to a fab lab to make a fab lab. And at just this moment, we're transitioning from Fab Labs 1.0 to Fab Labs 2.0 of Fab Labs making Fab Labs, really right at the point to be able to do it. There's lots of bad DIY 3D printers. This is much more fundamentally revisiting just the foundations of machine building to make good machines that are good enough to make their own parts to do the range of things. Um, so that'll get us up to millions. Um, in history of computing then, we reached billions in the era of smartphones and tablets and things like that. So billions is now getting to the number of people on the planet. Um, and there we have a problem. A fab lab can make everything I showed you. The catch is this is the inventory. You can't 
see it resume out. This is all the stuff you need, all the resins and all the parts that have to go in the Fab Lab to make the stuff. And this is a blow up of the DigiKey section of the electronic components. Um, and so DigiKey stocks 500,000 types of resistors, 500,000 types of capacitors, 500,000 types of inductors. Conceptually, though, there's only three properties, conducting, insulating, resistive. Um, and so to look at scaling, what we've been studying are digitized, not the designs, but actually the materials themselves. We've been developing digital materials that code their construction. So this is nano Lego made in my lab. It works just like Lego, but it's nano Lego. Um, and so this is a design tool where you make electronics by placing blocks of these functional material. Um, you model the physics, and then you export it as an assembly sequence. And then we've been making machines. Um, this is a first generation uh, where this machine isn't a printer or a cutter, it's an assembler. So it takes a feedstock of micro Lego and snaps it together into functional three-dimensional volumes um, to build functional systems. And so that has all sorts of interesting implications. One of the most interesting ones is there isn't trash. Trash is analog. Trash means there isn't information in the material to take it back apart again. Biology doesn't have trash. Here you can unbuild as well as build in the same way that a kid's room with Lego, you don't throw away the Lego, you reuse the parts. So um, that gets us to the billion scale. Now, the internet is approaching a trillion. Internet of Things is on its way to a trillion devices. If you look at the Nest thermostat, it has all the capabilities of the PDP. It's not a metaphor that the computing went thousand million, billion, trillion. It, it now fits in your pocket or on the wall, but it has the capabilities of the PDP. If we want a trillion fab labs, then the issue is if you assemble the way I'm describing, at a dynamic range of 10 to the 3 from the smallest to the big part, um, it would take a day, which is fine. But if you want a dynamic range of 10 to the 6, so if you want to make the transistors up to the phone, it would take a million years, which is a long time to wait for output. So um, you're a very serious group. Um, uh, um, so the solution to that is in biology, there are 20 parts, just like the micro Lego, you're made out of amino acids. What's interesting about amino acids is they're not interesting. Amino acids have typical properties. They're hydrophobic, hydrophilic, basic acidic. But just by taking those 20 properties, this is how your muscles move. Um, this is how you smell. This is how you think. But the heart of it is um, this is the ribosome. This is the molecular assembler. And ribosomes make ribosomes. Ribosomes are slow. They go one hertz. One per second, they bolt an amino acid together. But your cells can have a million, and you can have trillions of cells. So while you're sitting here listening to me, you're placing 10 to the 18 parts a second. And it's because the assembler can make itself. And so the real core of stream research is you could do this in biology. Um, we're part of a collaboration that's designing and making synthetic cells, where you design a cell in a computer you output it and you boot up the cell. But that's limited to the biological materials. Um, you can do the same thing in non-biological materials. So here are inorganic analogs to amino acids. You can assemble hierarchically. Um, and so in biology, there's a linear coding sequence of the amino acids. That's the design. But the design doesn't describe it. It becomes the thing. The code folds into geometrical motifs. They become functional elements, like electron donors or acceptors. Those then become machines, like molecular motors. And so that's primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. In the same sense, what we're doing is we're making micro and nano Lego that you assemble into functional elements that make modules and then make systems to build self-reproducing machines, machines that can make themselves. And so um, uh, uh, with just rigid and flexural parts, you can make a four-bar linkage. This is electronics interconnect. This is logic. Um, here's an example of this is five part types, a rigid and a flexible part type, and a magnetic and an inductive part that could in turn, and we will make them out of still smaller parts. And so that's a motor. That's a linear motor. Here's a rotary motor. Um, when it zooms in, you'll see how, how the different part types work together. You can drive it in phase or out of phase. And so this is a motor made like Lego out of a small set of building blocks as part of making the self-reproducing machine 
uh, that can make itself. And again, this is one level up. In turn, we're making smaller parts, make these parts out of to get all the way down to the fundamental properties. So that's driving it uh, in phase or out of phase. Um, and so we're on the way to making a self-reproducing assembler. And um, uh, so to step back now, um, what I just sketched uh, very quickly was um, uh, computing did uh, one, one thousand, one million, one billion, one trillion. That's not a metaphor. Your ears could glaze over, but literally it's a thousand million, billion, trillion. Digital fabrication has done from one to one thousand. Um, we're heading towards the million with the machines making machines. We're heading towards the billion with the assemblers. We're heading towards the trillion with the self-assemblers. All of those exist today, just like with Gordon Moore, you could see all of them in 1965. They're all in a lab today, but they're gonna come out anywhere from right now to 50 years in the future. But this meeting, you shouldn't look at this point in time, you should really see that you're in the middle of this thousand million billion scaling arc. And so, one way to understand where that leads is, this is one of my favorite questions. This is a program I did um, with Bill Nye and some interesting people for the uh, bonus material, the movie The Martian. They wanted to know, how do you actually bootstrap a civilization on Mars? And um, at this point in the talk, you can probably recognize what's behind me. Uh, ISRU, in situ resource utilization, which is what you call going to Mars and living, uh, historically had a model that was roughly the model of the Gingery books, if you know those. The Gingery books are these amazing books where book one is make a charcoal furnace, book two is use the charcoal furnace to make hand tools, and by book seven you have a machine shop. It's sort of how you can redo your own industrial revolution. And so the models of colonizing space assume digikey, assume 500,000 resistors in effect, but what we're finding is you can create all of modern technology out of about 20 parts. Um, in fact, uh, one of the programs funding us was to reduce the whole technical supply chain to 20 parts. And you take these 20 properties that you compose hierarchically, and really this is asking this amazing question, which is what are the minimum building blocks to bootstrap a viable civilization? And it's not 500,000 resistors from DigiKey, it's really these very fun, small set of material properties you compose hierarchically in this very deep way where you merge communication, computation, and fabrication. Um, the pioneers of computing, so uh, I'm happy to take credit for the observation that computer science was one of the worst things to ever happen to computers or to science. <laughs> because it's fundamentally unphysical, but I worked once removed with the founders of computer science, of uh, John von Neumann and Alan Turing, and both of them ended their life studying fabrication. Um, John von Neumann studied self-reproducing machines, um, Turing studied morphogenesis, how genes create form, how you embody computation, not to design construction, but actually embedded in construction. Um, and so if you take that 50-year uh, scaling, now to come back to the present, the news today is dominated by trade wars, tariff, import quotas, uh, jobs, unemployment, um, economic inequality. That whole dialogue assumes you need jobs to get work, to get money, to get things. And then with the money, you then buy things that come from supply chains. Um, if you know, William Gibson famously observed, the future is here today, but it's not uniformly distributed. And if I look around at colleagues who run Fab Labs today, um, Elliot or Jean-Michel, remind me your first name? Uh, yeah, uh, what he said. Um, <laughs> uh, um, can go into their labs and do everything I showed you and really meet their needs, but it's still at this level of thousands, not billions, um, but it's scaling exponentially. And so rather than fighting over trade wars and import and creating jobs, you can provide access to the means to create and really create a new notion of economy, that rather than getting the money to buy something, you can make the thing. And you could make it for yourself, 
you could do it for barter, a friend could do it, but it's really bootstrapping another, a, a new notion of an economy. Again, it's not a projection now. While the world's covering Barcelona separatism, what's actually happening in Barcelona is they're making this new infrastructure for what is a city. While the world is covering Detroit bankruptcy, in Detroit they're deploying these networks and bootstrapping a new economy in Detroit. One of the mo I was on Capitol Hill last week on this bill for universal access, and one of the most interesting parts is, is in the um, Senate, the co-sponsors are Chris Van Hollen, Democrat, and Lisa Murkowski, Republican. In the House, the co-sponsors are Bill Foster, the most liberal, bluest of Democrats, and Thomas Massey, who came from MIT originally, who's beyond the right of the Freedom Caucus. He, he wrote one of my favorite bills. I hate the content, but I love the bill. He wrote a bill that was one sentence, the Department of Education is abolished. <laughs> uh, but, but the interesting thing is Thomas Messi over Hill and Bill Foster over there completely merge around digital fabrication. The, you know, it, we're working with counterparts in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in um, rural Tennessee, in the reddest of red states and the bluest of blue states. But this is a rare issue that's completely nonpartisan. Everybody agrees with it. But this isn't just makers. It's not just outreach. It's really creating a fundamentally new economy that does an end run around most divisive issues today. And again, that's not a projection, that's actually what's happening. The real challenge is the scaling, that if I go back, and I'll end with this, um, another overused quote is Wayne Gretzky asked why he was so good at playing ice hockey, and his answer was, he skates to where the puck's gonna be, not where it is. A and a lot of the maker movement is skating to where the puck is. <laughs> Um, we're already here, scaling to millions and billions and trillions raises a whole bunch of different questions for how you really take what we're doing on the scale to change an economy. We have the existence proofs, in a way the technology is the easy part, what's been really hard is building the organizational capacity to keep up with the scaling, but look ahead now not to this meeting being, you know, the 50 or 100 people here, but being 100,000 people, because that's what the data says. I'll, you know, I'll go back here, um, we're, we're here. This is gonna keep scaling. How do you do what you're doing in this, but, but to reach a majority of the planet? That's the opportunity and that's the challenge I'll leave you with. Thank you. And I assume questions are informally later. Uh, if there's time, quick questions, yep. Um, so the question is the influence of AI. Um, the most interesting part of that question is the project, single project most excited about, which is um, th there's an epistemological question of who designed the designer. So religion has spent a lot of time working on that question. Um, the heart of your design is one of the oldest parts of the genome. Um, they're called morphogenes, like the Hox genes. And these are these genes that control genes for design. So in evolution, evolution doesn't do what most people think. Most things you could do to the genome either are fatal or inconsequential. What the Hox genes are is they're actually computer programs in your genome. You're, you're actually, they get read out like a program, and they don't store you. They don't store your body plan. They store a program that makes you that results in the body plan. And they do that for a foundational AI reason, which is you can't search over the genome, you can search over this representation, which is exactly how AI works. And so the oldest part of the genome embodies molecular AI that leads to our design. And so one of the most interesting programs we're in is how to do that now for technology. So how you don't design technology, you grow technology, not by a naive searching that doesn't work, but by actually implementing morphogenesis in technology. So it's, it's sort of literally embodying AI as, you know, if I can place a billion parts, you can't, it'll break every known design tool and so to grow the designs. Uh, question? Yeah. Yeah. A gingery, G-I-N-G-E-R-Y. And I, I love them and I hate them. I, lo I, I love them for the obvious reason, um, but if you're going to read them, what I would also suggest is you should also try to understand this slide, which is the foil to gingery, which is how you can bypass that and have 20 properties and make everything just from, from those parts. 
Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry, there's one, we'll do one last one. Sorry, how I manage my patience with the time scale? <laughs> yep. So yeah, so, I mean, so the, the, the just real quick answers. Um, the way I manage the time scale is I'm easily amused. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, you know, getting to a thousand fab labs was exciting. We're now building these organizations to get to a million, which is exciting. This new machine building technology is really satisfying. The assemblers are making progress. The self-assemblers are leading to this wild reinvention. They're all happening today, but they're all happening on different time scales. And if you Focus on any one, you'll go crazy. But if you integrate over all of them as a basis set, uh, it works for me. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you.